Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day for Friday, the sixth day of September, year of our Lord, 2024. I do pray this finds you well. Pregnancy Center, uh, Christ, uh, Pregnancy Resources, Walk for Life tomorrow, 8.30, down at Ben Butterworth Parkway. Hopefully you had a chance to sign up, and even if you didn't, come, come. The more, the better. Uh, the more, the more, the better. So uh, please, uh, 8.30 tomorrow, I'll be down there, Lord willing. So uh, hopefully we'll see you all down there. should be a beautiful day, beautiful day today. Uh, breezy, but in a cool day, uh, felt good, uh, felt good. So hopefully the bugs uh, uh, are coming to an end. And hopefully, I uh, this is where I kind of know very little about farming, about when to harvest and how dry weather at the end of the season affects the harvest. I know, I remember watching the beet harvesters back in Michigan out in the rain. That's uh, a little bit later in the season. Miserable. So we're, we look, we're having quite a dry spell. Uh, which could create some problems. We'll get the farmers in our prayers. In fact, I'll make a note of that. Um, I remember lots of uh, field fires of when it was dry like this, and you want the crops again to be dry. So we'll pray for a bountiful harvest and for favorable weather, whatever that means. And I'm just pleading ignorance here about what's the, the best kind of weather. No downpours, but like at the end of the season, do you still need some good rain to help the crops finish? Don't know. Don't know. Are they pretty much ripening now? Uh, drying out. Uh, so anyway, we'll uh, leave that to the hands of the experts, and I'll just pray for favorable weather, but we, we thank the Lord for the abundance of harvest. Also, so remember, Pregnancy Resources Walk for Life tomorrow. Uh, it's a way to really, to, to raise money, of course, but also to show our face in the community. Uh, um, abortion is a very contentious issue. Oddly enough, even in the, I'm going to use the scare quotes, Christian church, Shouldn't be. No discussion at all. Scripture's very clear on the sanctity of life from conception until natural death. Very clear. Uh, uh, which means God is very clear, right? Anyway, um, just come down and, and, and show our neighbors that there are a lot of us. Um, also, now having said that, on, uh, on Sunday will be the circuit-wide youth picnic out at Zion and Taylor Ridge. I have room for one more person in my car. We have a couple of cars coming uh, from our area heading out there, and your kids from all the circuit churches will be there. So that'll be a, a very nice afternoon, 3 to 6, out at Zion, Taylor Ridge. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last, amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Tonight we turn again to Ephesians chapter 3 this evening. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, 
that you, being rooted and grounded and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be fulfilled with all the fullness of God. To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that is the word of the Lord in the end of chapter 3 of this wonderful letter of St. Paul's to the church in Ephesus, the church of all times, uh, us as well. Ephesus, again, was a city, a lead city of, in ancient Rome. Uh, today, uh, my geography serves me correct, would be Turkey. And uh, um, uh, it uh, uh, is the, the river there and everything was, is all silted in, so the, the city is just there in ruins. But the, the letter was written around the year 8060 on the heels of Paul's third missionary journey. As I mentioned the last couple of nights, Paul spent at least three years in Ephesus, and it's one of the hubs of the ancient Christian church. So Paul's a prisoner on Jesus, for Jesus Christ. Uh, um, uh, he spends a year and a half in, uh, uh, um, in prison, uh, and then two years under house arrest in Rome. And uh, he's a prisoner, and that, there's something we can say about that, but we'll save that for when we read Philippians. Uh, he talks more about it there, about how God works even in, in great suffering. Uh, he says, okay, he is, he is a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. You know, how do they know? They, they know. He's told them the story. Why is he an apostle? He's not one of the, you know, the 12 appointed when Christ walked among the earth. He is appointed by Christ, but that was that Damascus Road experience that happens after the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And after the stoning of Stephen and Paul standing there, Saul, as he's still known at that point, uh, standing there giving uh, his approval. And anyway, he is uh, given this mystery. Uh, and the mystery is this. And this was, a, this was a go to Acts through the first uh, uh, several chapters of the book of Acts, kind of culminating in Acts chapter 15. What about the Gentiles? Now, Pentecost, you know, is when the church goes out, and the, the first clue, this is for everybody, the people hear the apostles speaking in their own language. However, well, that's, you know, that's still in Jerusalem, and the people are gathered there for the Feast of Pentecost are predominantly Jews. Uh, but now they're going to go out. You know, it's, there, a number of things are going to happen. There's going to be some persecution that forces them to go out. It's funny how God works that way. And uh, ultimately, Paul is called, as we hear, as I mentioned a moment ago, he is uh, the agent of that persecution in, in, in a number of cases. And he's going out trying to bring these followers of the way, Christians, in before the Jewish authorities to, to uh, face uh, justice for their charge of blasphemy. Because uh, in their mind, there is only one God, uh, and Jesus Christ is not it. Uh, where we confess the Holy Trinity, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as you know, God reveals himself to us, it is through Jesus Christ. He is the face of God among us. Now, it doesn't mean there's uh, Jesus goes in and pretends to be the Father, and, uh, and then goes in to be the Spirit. That's not what I'm saying. The Trinity is a mystery. Three persons in one God. But Jesus is what we see. And remember what Jesus says. There's no getting to the Father except through him. It's a powerful statement, especially if you're a first century Jew. It's a big deal for Paul to confess this. But the mystery is this. And this is what he gets to proclaim, is that you know, the Gentiles, that's you and me. You know, I don't know if anybody listening to this, some of you might have a Jewish background. I do not. Uh, uh, I, I have certainly colleagues, even in the ministry, that have come from Jewish families and stuff like that. There aren't many. It's really cool uh, to hear their stories. Uh, um, a little heartbreaking at times, too, because often they're ostracized from their families. And that's, uh, the faith comes often with a high price tag. Uh, it's all a gift. Uh, but as we follow it and make our voice known in the community, it, it, uh, you find that this you know, domain here is uh, even though he's been defeated, is still where Satan roams and hates what we say and do, and uh, and our own sinful selves hate that. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, the mystery in the New Testament era is now made known. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. 
And then he goes on and talks about his call. Uh, one thing I want to say about that, though, is that how, you know, what are the implications for, for this for us today? It is God who makes us what we are in Christ, uh, through Christ, through the gifts of the church, which bestow Christ upon us, pour the Spirit into us, which make us Christian. It is God who, who makes us what we are, not us. And so it doesn't matter where people start. You, you don't get bragging rights. Now, you know, I, I don't run into this too much. Uh, when I was training, I ran into it more. Uh, maybe that was the context back there, right? And that church that I, I trained at, and was certainly at seminary at the same time, but you're assigned to a church, was going through some not, not turmoil, uh, uh, but, you know, there, some decisions had to be made about the finances and, and how the finances were going to affect the long-term operation of the church uh, because the where the church was located was a um, uh, an area that was changing. Not, you know, it was a nice neighborhood, but just, uh, anyway, you know, the, the growth was out, as many communities out in the suburbs and stuff. And, and churches just have to face these things at times. Uh, and those things can be very, you know, heart-wrenching and sometimes contentious that it's okay you know, people are talking about money and things but it was funny to hear uh, interesting to me to hear people say you know well, i've been a lutheran all my life and, and but then you know when somebody else made an argument that was actually very good you know but they were dismissed and only heard us a couple of times because you know this somehow you were a lutheran all your life well thanks be to god if you were really you know um but it doesn't mean those people are less christian because they haven't been Lutheran. I haven't been Lutheran all my life. So maybe I'm a little sensitive to these things. But, but or, or people who were pagan and come into the church. They might be very intelligent people. They might have you know, good ideas about how the church should be governed and use the money. Now, certainly people who are new to the church, and I do observe this, tend to defer to people who've been around a long time, uh, 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 you know, in, in a particular church, because they know people and kind of know the ropes. That's very normal. And certainly very appropriate. Uh, but they also have thoughts and opinions uh, of, of their own. And maybe they have gifts to do those things. Uh, and maybe sometimes you need some, you know, fresh blood, if you will, you know, some fresh eyes, maybe that's a better way to say it, to, you know, look at things and say, well, you know, maybe we're kind of stuck here, but here's a bigger picture. And here's my experience that, that comes into this and says, okay, this. So, um, a couple of ways we see what Paul is saying here today is like, okay, um, it is, it, it is Christ that makes us what we are. It's not the name on the door, although we are not ashamed to be Lutheran and our Lutheran doctrine is incredibly beautiful uh, and people do gravitate towards it because it's just so profound. Um, and, and, and you know, and 100% scriptural, um, it's amazing. We don't have to, 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 to use rationalism and do mental gymnastics or anything like that. We just go with the words on the page and we say amen. And we're, we're very comfortable with mystery, too, for that reason. We're like, I can't explain that, but this is what he says. Okay, you know, um, it's really cool. You know, and right in the front of that, confessing that Christ actually walked among us and died and rose again from the dead. You know, this is a historical faith um, that we are, are, are uh, called into. Uh, and just by the way, um, I talk about this in Bible study all the time because uh, it's just so cool. The word for church in the Greek New Testament is, uh, you'll have word synagogue and stuff like that. That's a, that's a transliteration. But, uh, but the Christian word church um, is ecclesia. Uh, and, and we get ecclesiastical. It's not a common word. I know uh, we use it uh, amongst pastors in the church. You, you certainly you've heard of it. Uh, but ecclesiastical things are church-related things. Uh, so ecclesia, the word for church, it's a compound word. Uh, so ek, like exit, like exoskeleton. It's a, um, uh, it, it's a, it's a little, you know, word that means uh, uh, out. Um, and kaleo is call. You are called out. Um, you're called to be something else. You're called out of the sinful, fallen world into a new life in Christ, into the way. That's an ancient way of speaking of the church, very scriptural. Uh, followers of the way. Paul uses that word quite a, way, quite a bit. Uh, so we are called out. And it is God who does that. 
calls us through the gospel. You think of Luther's explanation for the, it's not lost on Luther. Luther was a, a biblical language scholar when he comes up with his explanation for the third article of creed. When, and when you know Luther comes up with those explanations, he's not like, well, you know, like just thinking, oh, you know, come up with something. He, he's trying to synthesize, to summarize big chunks of scripture into a very simple sentence or two that sort of, you just sort of very briefly, but very profoundly summarizes what scripture teaches. It's a nice entryway into to what scripture, that's why we still use it today. After 500 years, it is magnificent. Uh, two, two textbooks I use for confirmation. That's it. Number one, the Bible, and two, the catechism. That's it. Um, you know, um, uh, there's all kinds of people writing all kinds of books. Good. If, you, if that helps you, use it. I use the Bible, and I use the catechism, and that's all I've used for, you know, I think I made the mistake of not using that for the first couple of years, and I was like, what am I doing here? But anyway, so the, the third article, Luther's explanation of the third article of the Creed, and the Creed is just a summary of what Scripture teaches. That's, it's a statement of faith, and it's guardrails, too. You know, it's like, this is what the church confesses. You know, that's why we have them. They're called ecumenical creeds, so the church in all times and all places confesses these creeds, or should. And we... Uh, uh, the third article of the Creed, which, you know, I mean, the Trinity is involved with all three articles of the Creed, but, you know, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Christian Church will say it in a moment. Uh, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And Luther's beautiful explanation is like, you know, I believe that the Holy Spirit has called and enlightened me by the gospel. <laughs> you know, there it is. And, you know, and through that same gospel, he keeps me and all believers in the faith, you know. You are called by the word of Christ, the gospel. Right now, the gospel, the word of Christ, brings us to the things that we taste and touch and feel through baptism. You know, why do we baptize? Well, the word of Christ tells us. And you know you're called out because the word of Christ says, go make disciples by baptizing, and you are baptized. All right? you, uh, um, you know what you receive when you participate in the Lord's Supper. You know, his body, his blood, because he says it, the word of Christ tells us, and it's for our forgiveness. It's that body and blood that put our sin to death that's coming into you, that nourish you and strengthen you in these dark and latter days. Even though you're baptized, you still need to be nourished and fed because you're constantly under attack from within and without, your own sinful self, even though you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and of course Satan and the world around us. Right? You're called by the gospel, enlightened by the gospel. Oh, it's beautiful. So Paul is here saying everybody, there's only one gospel, are all heirs, called out by that gospel. We rejoice when people, maybe we've known them for a long time, and they are poor, miserable sinners, and maybe they've lived such a life where their sin has left a public, you know, train wreck. Broken relationships, kids out of wedlock. By the way, it was Augustine, great church father, kid out of wedlock. Um, uh, uh, maybe abortions. Yes, there's forgiveness for, for people who have had abortions and those who perpetrate those things. Uh, you know, welcome to the repentant church. Uh, we rejoice that because of the blood of Christ and, the, you know, it's only the blood of Christ that makes us what we are, that they are now heirs alongside us. Absolutely. And guess what? They're still going to let us down. They're still going to sin just like we do. Let each other down. We who have been members of the church for a long time, and have lived through arguments and, and petty little squabbles and, you know, people keeping little grudges and stuff like that. None of it belongs in the church, but it happens. Because guess what? Sinners there too. Lifelong Christians. Lifelong sinners. All at the same time. So, this is the mystery. You know, and it's a great one. That Paul gets to go out, as we do, and proclaim to everyone we meet. You know, covered by the blood of Christ. You, Christ died for you. You know, everyone you meet, every every eyes, every pair of eyes that you see throughout the workday and wherever you go, wherever you're at tonight, if you're going out later tonight, go see a movie or something like that. Every person you meet, Christ died for. You know, and he wants them all to be heirs of the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, in all of this, as Paul keeps reminding us through Christ, in this beautiful section, he ends with this beautiful doxology. Um you know, as he often break into prayer, and then it, just like we do as Christians, like you know, you know, Amen. You know, just you know, this is God speaking. So to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. A beautiful doxology. Doxology, doxa is a Greek word that means glory, and so a doxology is 
we, 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 we usually stand for those in church where we sing them or speak them because uh, we're, we're, we're glorifying the name of the Holy Trinity. All right, a lot I could say about that, um, 3920, so let's continue by confessing our faith. To believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for the preaching of the Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and for the spread of his knowledge throughout the whole world. We pray for the persecuted and oppressed that they would stand firm and you would turn the hearts of those who inflict such evil as you did for St. Paul. As always, we pray for the sick and the dying, that you would place your hand upon them, heal the sick, and comfort the dying with the promise of a joyful reunion before your throne with all those who went before us in the faith. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless farmers as they prepare to bring in their crops. We ask you to bless them with favorable weather and safety. Uh, and we ask you to uh, allow them to uh, have such an abundant harvest that their personal needs may be met and their families may be provided for as you use them to provide for, for all of us. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless the walk for life tomorrow. Maybe there uh, be an abundance of people that show up as we proclaim uh, by our actions, our, our love for the sanctity of life in our communities. Bless the work of pregnancy resources as they not only care for the unborn child and helping mothers uh, uh, keep from ending the life of the children in, in their womb, but also to provide for their needs as they so wonderfully do uh, uh, throughout gestation and then even after the delivery of the child to help fathers um, and to help them with clothing and diapers and food. Uh, this is all the sources, uh, the wonderful things that they provide. So be with us tomorrow as we gather and allow uh, um, uh, your people in our community to uh, share the abundance that you shower upon us to support these organizations. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, and all things. Let your holy angels be with me, the evil foe. They have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I um, can try to do justice to them. I just kind of tank it at the end. So forgive me if I do. This is that wonderful uh, Paul Gerhard hymn, um, Jesus, thy boundless love. I mean, you know, if you'll permit me, what I will do, so maybe I won't tank it, is I will call up the music and... And let it play along with me. This thy boundless love to me, no thought can reach, no tongue declare. Unite my thankful heart to thee, and reign without a rival there. Thine holy, thine alone I am. Be thou alone, 
my constant flame. Oh, grant that nothing in my soul may dwell but thy pure love alone. Oh, may thy love possess me whole, my joy, my treasure, and my crown. All coldness from my heart removed, my every act would not be love. Is that wonderful Gerhardt hymn? A uh, beautiful pastor and hymn writer, uh, died in 1676, and that's Jesus, thy boundless love to me, 683, and that's the first two of four stanzas. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a blessed rest, and by God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.